Okay, so now to the excellent matter at hand. I have two fantastic authors to introduce tonight. Um, Barbara Schuholm is the editor of the anthology Steady As She Goes, Women's Adventures at Sea. Her essays and travel stories have appeared in the New York Times, the American Scholar, Smithsonian, and on Slate.com. As Barbara Wilson, she's the author of numerous books, including her memoir, Blue Windows, A Christian Science Childhood, the feminist classic, Murder in the Collective, one of my favorites. Oh, you know, and her award-winning book, Gowdy Afternoon, which was made into a fabulous movie starring Judy Davis. And then next to her, we have Susan Orlean, who is the New York Times bestselling author of The Orchid Thief, The Bullfighter Checks Her Makeup, and Saturday Night. A staff writer for The New Yorker, her articles have also appeared in Outside, Rolling Stone, Vogue, and Esquire, and she has been called a national treasure by the Washington Post. And she was played with some creative liberties by Meryl Streep in the film Adaptation. <laughs> but we haven't just brought these two together tonight because they're enormously powerful writers whose books have been adapted into critically acclaimed films, though given the trends on adapting great books for the screen, that's in itself quite an accomplishment. We brought them to you tonight because they are, in the best sense, women of the world. Brave, creative, endlessly curious, and slightly wild. And because, lucky for us, they've both written fantastic books about their adventures and here to talk to, about them, please welcome Barbara Schuholm and Susan, Susan Orlean. Thank you. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here tonight in Boston at Leslie College and thank the Center for New Words for hosting this event. Um, I'm going to be reading for a little while um, from my book, The Pirate Queen, which was published this summer, and it mostly is the story of my travels around the North Atlantic looking for stories about women in the sea. And I went from Ireland to Scotland to Orkney to Shetland to the Faroes to Iceland and Norway in search of these stories. Some of them are very heroic and adventurous, like the one about Grace O'Malley, uh, the pirate queen in the 16th century who lived in, in Ireland on Clue Bay. But I also, in the course of my travels, ran into a lot of people who said, women, women never went to the sea. They never went to the fishing, lassie, they would tell me. <laughs> so I also wanted to give a flavor of that because often when I'm doing my readings, and I have a slideshow too that I sometimes show, I, I like to show my heroic pictures of Grace O'Malley or the mannequins of Grace O'Malley anyway in the museum in Ireland or talk about Leif Erikson's sister, Freitas Eric's daughter, who also made a voyage to the New World. Um, but tonight I want to read a, a, a section, a chapter, called The Lonely Voyage of Betty Muat, and this is set in the Shetland Islands. It was a bitter cold day at the end of January 1886 when Betty Muat took passage on a ship bound for Lairwick. Some might wonder why Betty didn't just walk the 24 miles from her home at the southernmost tip of the Shetland Islands to the capital. Walking was common at a time when the roads were bad and few had money for horse travel. It was winter, after all, and the seas were notoriously rough. But Betty Muat didn't walk. She'd been born with one leg shorter than the other. She was also, by the standards of the day, old and rather frail. She was 59. Betty Muat had traveled to Lairwick by ship many times before, carrying shawls and other knitting to sell in town. The morning she embarked on the Columbine, she had a bundle of 40 shawls, as well as a bottle of milk and two halfpenny biscuits for sustenance on the journey. The voyage was expected to last two or three hours, and Betty was the only passenger. Eight days later, the Columbine smashed into the Norwegian coast, 300 miles to the northeast. Betty was still the only passenger. She was also the only person on the ship. In order to find the house where Betty Muat had lived, I'd come by bus from Lairwick down to Sumbra Head, a journey that now takes about half an hour. Sumbra is the longer of two pincher-shaped peninsulas that seem to reach out after Fair Isle, which can just be seen on the horizon. Sumbra is the site of the bronze and Iron Age ruins of Jarlshof and the Victorian hotel that was once the home of the Laird of Sumbra. In Betty's day, the land was inhabited by crofters, tenants of the Laird, who fished and farmed in a limited way. 
Now much of it is home to Shetland's main airport. Betty lived with her half-brother and his family in a small stone house on the shorter of the two pinchers known as Scatness. When Betty Muat set off in the Columbine, the day was cold and clear, but the wind came up offshore and the sea quickly grew heavy. The skipper, James Jameson, and his two crewmen regularly sailed up and down the Shetland coast. But that day, luck wasn't with him. In resetting the sail for the stronger wind, he and his first mate were swept off the ship. The mate managed to claw his way back on board, but to his great distress he saw Captain Jameson, of whom he was very fond, still flailing in the sea. The mate and the other crewmen immediately launched a boat to save the captain, but they were too late. The captain's head had disappeared. Worse, when they turned back to the Columbine, they found that the ship had already tacked off to the northeast. It was all they could do to get themselves through heavy surf to shore. When the voyage began, Betty Muat had settled herself below deck with her quart bottle of milk and two biscuits. The ship soon began to roll so much that when she heard shouting, she wasn't able to climb up to the open hatchway to take a look. She heard, get away the boat, and then nothing except the wind. When she finally managed to get up the stairs, she found the boom swinging wildly in the gale, the mainsail flapping, and all three crewmen gone. Waves were breaking over the bow. The sky had darkened. A terrible storm was taking shape around her. By the time I went looking for Betty Muat's croft house in Skatness, I had been in Shetland about a week, asking my usual questions about women in the sea. My bed and breakfast host in Lairwick, Mr. Gifford, first told me about two girls from an island in the north of Shetland who drifted to Norway in a boat. Later I read about these two servant girls from the small island of Uyea, south of Unst, who had rowed over to the even smaller islet of half Gruni to milk cows kept there for grazing. On the return trip, they ran into a gale and were carried across the sea to the Norwegian coast. It's said they married Norwegians. At any rate, they never returned. A surprising number of girls were blown over the northern seas, it turned out. (laughs) Some were from England, a couple from Holland, the majority from Scotland. Although some were blown south, more drifted to the Norwegian coast, the result, no doubt, of the Gulf Stream's north-flowing current. It was of interest to me that almost all the men I asked in Shetland about women in the sea immediately began to tell me the story of Betty Muat and the other women and girls who had drifted to Norway in boats. The greatest drifter of them all, of course, was St. Sunava, whose name now adorns the ship that had brought me to Lairwick. St. Sunava was a 10th century Christian princess from Ireland who, in escaping from her Viking persecutors, jumped into a ship with her companions and pushed off without benefit of oars, rudders, or sails because she trusted in God to save them. Although St. Sunava bypassed Shetland to land in Norway, the remains of a chapel once dedicated to her can be found on the small isle of Balta off Unst. No one knows how long it took St. Sunava to reach Norway, but it took Betty Muad and the Columbine more than a week. For all that time, she had no idea where she was and no way of ascertaining. The storm battered the ship for four days before there was a respite and some sun, and then another storm blew up. Betty Muat had nothing to eat but her milk and biscuits. She spent most of her time holding on to a rope and bracing herself against the rolling of the ship. Only at the end did she see land and shortly afterward feel the shock of the Columbine going aground. By some miracle, the Columbine had missed the reefs off an island north of Olesund and had lodged itself firmly on the rocks. Betty climbed on deck and found two boys on shore staring at her. They shouted to each other in their own language, and then the boys ran off to help. Fishermen, not far away, had been watching the lurching of the boat and its crash onto the rocks. They were astonished to find an elderly woman on board, alone. The image of women drifting helplessly in the sea and being rescued after a harrowing voyage seemed to be an appealing one to my male informants. (laughs) But Mr. Gifford was able to tell me a few other stories when I persisted. He had once been a lighthouse keeper on one of the rocky isles of the Outscaries, a group of islands northeast of Lairwick. Mr. Gifford recalled that because the Outscaries had no peat, 
Women would row in open boats over the island of Walesy, over to the island of Walesy, to cut the peat in spring and collect it in autumn after the bricks were dry. These women must have been very strong, I said, after looking at a map. It was no little distance from the outscaries to Walesy. It looked at least ten miles over a rough stretch of water. Oh, aye, said Mr. Gifford. They would be strong to row that far and back. Douglas Sinclair, the chief librarian at the Lairwick Library, agreed. The women of Trondra were also well known for their rowing abilities, he told me. Trondra is one of several islands tucked next to the west coast of Shetland's mainland. They would row out for peats and out fishing and to take the sheep back and forth to new grazing places. The men would be away at the fishing, and the women would do everything. That's why they were such strong rowers. Once, early this century, the men of the Royal Navy in Scalloway challenged the Trondra women to a regatta, and the women won. <laughs> there should be a photo of the Trondra women upstairs in the museum. You ask up there. They'll find you the photos. I'd been upstairs already and had found a typical maritime museum. Wide plank, dark stained floors, and glass cases full of sextants, barometers, and nautical curiosities from scrimshaw boxes to carved coconuts to peg legs, with nary a trace of women in all the exhibits. But now, emboldened by Douglas's enthusiasm, I rang the bell and told the curator that I'd like to look in the archives for pictures of women in the sea. Women? <laughs> women in the sea. He drew his eyebrows together. Women didn't go to the fishing, he explained politely. Nope, they didn't go to the fishing. They stayed at home. They did everything else, the animals, the food, the clothing, the children, the farming. But they didn't go to the sea. They didn't go to the fishing. Only men did that. Women in the sea, you say. There was Betty Muad, of course. Mm. I said that the librarian downstairs had told me that the women of Trondra were renowned as rowers, that they'd beaten the Royal Navy in a regatta. Hmm, yes, well, yes he said, and pulled a couple of stacks of photographs out. You can look. I don't know if you'll find anything, though. It was with a small flash of triumph that I came across two old photographs, one of the women of Trondra rowing a boat and the other of women in Edwardian dress who may have been the winners of the regatta. There was also an illustration of Betty Muat going hand over hand on a rope stretched from the rock wrecked columbine to the Norwegian rocks. The publicity surrounding Betty Muad's voyage was extraordinary and international. While she recuperated in Norway from her ordeal, a journalist from Edinburgh made a special trip to interview her, and the resulting story appeared around the world, including in the New York Herald. Betty Muad's fantastic voyage inspired, inspired ballads in her honor and a number of illustrations, most of them dramatic but incorrect. For instance, weeks after I left Shetland and was up on a remote island in Norway's Lofoten chain, I ran across a colored rotogravure print on my way to the restroom in a small hotel. The illustration in the wall showed a terrified young girl with long blonde tendrils waving in the wind, cowering on the open deck of a storm-tossed ship. I had a sudden jolt of recognition. The plate of the ship read, The Columbine. The museum curator unbent a little when I showed him the photographs I'd found and asked if I could Xerox them. He even admitted that he'd heard something about the women rowers of Trondra. You might ask, he paused, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but she's the wife of Tommy Isbister, a boat builder who lives on Trondra. She's a rower, I seem to recall. I'd heard of Tommy Isbister when I'd been on the northern island of Unst a few days before. I decided to go up to Haraldswick to a small museum called the Unst Boat Haven. It was a glorious day when I set off from Uyea Sound, where I was staying at the youth hostel. First, I hitchhiked to Balta Sound, the first time I'd hitchhiked in about 22 years, and then walked along the highway a few kilometers. Although I was to go much farther north on my trip, there was something about Shetland, particularly Unst, that made me feel as though I were on top of the world it seemed that there was nothing to look at but the wild sky and the sea that changed from cobalt to purple in an instant. With a wind at my back, the very earth seemed insubstantial. Out in the sea was a small craft of some sort, with a white scale scudding like a top. Was it a white sail, or was it a sheep? 
I found myself considering the whole question of getting one sheep, much less two or three, into an open boat, and then rowing that sheep or those sheep from island to island in search of fresh pasturage. Sheep were big. Sheep were smelly, scared. How did the women get them into the boats and out of the boats? How did everyone keep their balance in a boat in the middle of the sea with the wind and the waves and the sheep bleeding and terrified? The Unz boat haven in Haraldswick was a barn of a place with lots of boats. Six serenes, traditional yoles, Faroese eight-man oared fishing boats with a coat of black tar. They had been lovingly restored in many cases by Tommy Isbister. A tall man came up to me, introducing himself as Robert, the volunteer curator. He was full of goodwill. Where are you from? Seattle? That's a long way. Which changed to suspicion when I said I was interested in women in the sea. <laughs> well, there was a woman who drifted to Norway in a boat, he said kindly. <laughs> Betty Muad was her name. She drifted all the way from Shetland to Norway. I know the story, I interrupted. <laughs> what else about women in boats? They didn't go to the fishing, he told me sternly. Only men went to the fishing. The women stayed home. Of course, women did a great many things. They raised the children, made the clothes, took care of the animals, grew the food. No, they certainly weren't idle, but they didn't go to the fishing. His reverent tone was backed up by the sacrosanct tools, craft, and fishing paraphernalia around me, the beautifully preserved boats, the nets on the walls, the hooks and baskets and buoys, the photographs, none of which showed a woman's face. I've heard they rowed out from the outscaries to Walesy to collect the peat, I said doggedly, so they must have had some familiarity with boats. They may have known how to row, he said after a minute. After all, a boat was how you got places in those days. And while the men were at the fishing, the women would have to keep things going, taking the sheep to different pastures to graze, gathering seaweed, catching a few fish for dinner. So the women did fish, I said eagerly, <laughs> too eagerly. They may have caught a few fish, <laughs> he conceded, but they didn't go to the fishing. I decided to ring Tommy Isbister's wife, who turned out to be a lovely woman named Mary. Like many Shetlanders, she was friendly and modest and seemed surprised I would be interested in her story. She had grown up in Scalloway in the 50s. Oh, yes, we all rowed, we girls growing up. My father taught me to row when I was seven. It was important to him that I be able to manage a boat correctly. He was severe about technique. Mary and Tommy Isbister lived on Trondra now. She ran the croft and her husband built traditional Shetland yoles, many of them for the new racing teams that had started up in the last few years. She told me that the Trondra women had always been strong rowers. They had rowed to Scalloway for provisions about a half a mile away from the island. Until 1970, there was no bridge to Trondra. A few women still commuted by boat. As for the boats, said Mary, they were the small, flat-bottomed ones we used to row in, a bit less safe than yoles. The yoles were used for collecting peats and taking lambs off one of the smaller islands for weaning. And did you fish at all? Oh, yes, we fished. <laughs> she again seemed surprised at my question. It was just one of the things we did then, part of life on the croft when the men were out at sea. You might call it pleasure fishing, but it was a necessary thing. What about the Royal Navy and the women of Trondra? It was about 1912, at any rate, before the First World War. A Royal Navy ship's crew challenged the men of Scalloway to a rowing competition. The women turned up instead and beat them. <laughs> I told her the evening before that I'd seen a group of women rowing across the Lairwick Harbor. Oh, yes, racing has become quite big again. Lots of women are taking it up. I've seen them myself rowing around the harbor. We talked a little more about women in boats, the whole question of getting sheep on and off a boat. She didn't mention Betty Muad. <laughs> it took me a long time to find Betty Muad's croft house. In the photograph, it had looked very charming, whitewashed stone with green trim. It had apparently been turned into a camping bod, a small dormitory-like hostel, and I toyed with the notion of staying there a night. Yet something about the emptiness of this far end of Shetland made me uneasy, and I found myself eager to take the bus back to the bustle of Lairwick. The sun was shining here, but the wind was picking up. 
My eyes smarted and my ears were beginning to ache. I wandered up a hill and down another, over to the edge of the sea and then back again in the direction of the fields skirting the airstrip. I crawled through a gap in a barbed wire fence and avoided sheep droppings. In the distance, I saw a few sheep and pondered whether I could ever get even, get even one of them into a boat and row it around. Finally, I saw two cottages off the runway and headed for them to ask directions. Who could possibly live next to a runway? It's not that Shetland is a major destination for the most of the rest of the world, but the islanders themselves come and go pretty frequently, and living practically in the middle of an airport can't be very restful. In the open door of the more run-down of the two cottages, I spied a man in his undershirt eating directly from a can of beans. I'm looking for Betty Muad's cottage, I said. I seem to have gotten turned around and ended up at the airport. Nope, you're in the right place, he said, still eating. It's the other house, though they just tore the original one down because they're digging up some ruins underneath. They built a new one for the campers. That rubble over there under the black tarp? That's Betty Muat's old croft. I thanked him and walked over to the cottage. There were two rooms of bunk beds and a kitchen with running water. At the archaeological site was a large hole in the ground with the stones of a house piled next to it under a black sheet of plastic. A small sign said they were excavating Old Scatness Broke, an Iron Age fort. A small jet began its ascent only a few hundred feet away. I covered my ears against the air-sucking roar. I actually felt a little disoriented between the Iron Age and the Space Age with a replica croft house, now including indoor plumbing, behind me. It was mind-numbing to think that in our day, Betty could have flown directly from her little stone house to Norway in about half an hour. Betty Muat's astonishing voyage seems to have the hand of either God or Lady Luck in it. Yet it's her quiet heroism that in the end impresses me. Except for an initial wail of horror when she discovered she was all alone on a ship rapidly heading out of sight of land, she seems throughout to have been composed and alert, though rather unhappy with the whole business. Fame did not unhinge her or bring on a fit of bragging. When she finally returned to Shetland to a rousing welcome, she went back to her croft house and her knitting, She lived a good many years longer until she was 93. I haven't been able to find out, however, whether she ever traveled by ship again. (laughs) Thank you. Well, that was a hard act to follow. Um, Let me... Pull this over. Thank you all for coming, and um, I'm very delighted to be here. And I hope that's that's at a good angle. All right. Are you keeping time? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, it's really a pleasure to read from this book, actually, because uh, there's something particular about reading about your own journeys. I've had the good fortune of being able to um, do a lot of traveling as a reporter for a lot of different reasons. And what I'm going to do is read three pieces that came about, not all of the, I'm going to read sort of miniature versions of three pieces that all came about for very different, um, it had very different origins. Sometimes I'll end up going on a trip merely because something has struck my fancy. I have a low threshold for something for anything that makes me wonder, what on earth is this? I can't resist. Um, and the first story I'm going to read from came about because I was visiting a friend who happened to have in his studio a um, taxidermy catalog. And I knew there were taxidermists in the world, but I thought there were probably three or four taxidermists. I never imagined that there was an industry that could support a catalog. <laughs> And I I was kind of, I actually um, kind of pilfered the catalog from my friend and got home and I was flipping through and there were things like bear noses and deer mannequins and I thought, this is amazing, who knew? And for me, the, the statement, who knew, is always the beginning of a story. Well, for my good luck, 
the World Taxidermy Championships were coming up. <laughs> so, and actually I went into my editor at The New Yorker and I said, um, I'd really like to go to the World Taxidermy <laughs> Championships. And he said, I don't think we have anyone else covering that. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to read a short piece from that piece. Um, and that that's sort of the category of stories where something will catch my eye, my curiosity, and I simply can't rest till I go find out what it is. Um, and then usually I have to buy one of whatever it was. So. And I do now have a taxidermy chicken at home. Um, so this piece is called Lifelike. As soon as the 2003 World Taxidermy Championships opened, the heads came rolling in the door. There were foxes and moose and freeze-dried wild turkeys, mallards and buffalo and chipmunks and wolves, weasels and buffleheads and bobcats and jackdaws, big fish and little fish and razorback boar. The deer came in herds, in carloads and on pallets, dozens and dozens of whitetail in row, half deer and whole deer and deer with deformities, sneezing and glowering and nuzzling and yawning, does chewing apples and bucks nibbling leaves. There were millions of eyes, foxes and bowls of them, some as small as a lentil and some as big as a poached egg. There were animal mannequins, blank-faced and brooding, earless and eyeless and utterly bald, ghostly gray dukers and spectral pine martens and black-bellied tree ducks from some other world. An entire exhibit hall was filled with equipment all the gear required to bring something dead back to life. Replacement noses for grizzlies, false teeth for beavers, fish fin cream, casting clay, upholstery nails. The championships were held in April at the Springfield, Illinois Crown Plaza Hotel, the sort of nicely appointed place that seems more suited to regional sales conferences than to having wolves in the corridors <laughs> and people crossing the lobby shouting, Heads up, buffalo coming through. <laughs> a thousand taxidermists converged on Springfield to have their best pieces judged and to attend such seminars as Mounting Flying Waterfowl and Whitetail Deer from a Master and Using a Fleshing Machine. In the Crown Plaza lobby, across from the concierge desk, a grooming area had been set up. The taxidermists were bent over their animals, holding flashlights to check problem areas like tear ducts and nostrils and wielding toothbrushes to tidy flyaway fur. People milled around greeting fellow taxidermists they hadn't seen since the last World Championships held in Springfield two years ago and talking shop. The word in the grooming area was that the piece to beat was Chris Kruger's happy-looking otters swimming in a perpetual circle around a leopard frog. A posting on taxidermy.net earlier in the week declared, everything about this mount kicks butt. <laughs> Kicking butt in this era of taxidermy requires having a mount that is not just lifelike, but also artistic. It used to be enough to do what taxidermists call fish-on-a-stick displays, now a serious competitor worries about things like flow and negative space and originality. One of this year's contenders, for instance, Ken Walker's giant panda, had artistry and accuracy going for it, along with the element of surprise. The thing looked 100% pure panda, but you can't go out and shoot a panda, and you aren't likely to get hold of a panda that has met a natural end, so everyone was dying to know how he'd done it. The day the show opened, Walker was in the grooming area, gluing bamboo into place behind the animal's back paws, and a crowd had gathered around him. Walker works as a staff taxidermist for the Smithsonian. He's a breezy, shaggy-haired guy whose hands are always busy. The panda was actually pretty easy, he was saying. I just took two black bears and bleached one of them. I think I use, I think I use Clairol Basic. Then I sewed the two skins together into a panda pattern. He took a toothbrush out and fluffed the fur in the panda's face. At the World Championship two years ago, a guy came in with an extinct Labrador duck. I was in awe. I thought, what could beat that, an extinct duck? I came up with this idea. He said he thought that the panda would get points for creativity alone. 
you can score a 98 with a squirrel, but it's still a squirrel, he said. (laughs) What did you do for toenails, Ken? Someone asked. I left the black bear's nails in, he said. They look pretty good. Another passerby stopped to admire the panda. He was carrying a grooming kit, which appeared to contain Elmer's glue, brown and black paint, a small tool set, and a bottle of suave mousse. I killed a a blonde bear once, he said to Ken. A 200-pound sow, whew, she made a beautiful mount. I'll bet, Ken said. He stepped back to admire the, the panda. I like doing recreations of these endangered animals, since that's the only way anyone's going to have one. Two years ago, I did a saber-tooth cat. I got an old lioness from a zoo, and I bleached her. <laughs> the big winner at the show turned out to be a tiny thing, a mount of two tree sparrows, submitted by a strapping German named Uwe Bausch, who had grown up in the former East Germany dreaming of competing in an American taxidermy show. <laughs> The, p- the piece was precise and lovely, almost haunting, since the more you looked at it, the more certain you were that the birds would just stop building their nest, spread their wings, and fly away. Early one morning, before I left Springfield, I took a last walk around the competition hall. It was quiet and uncanny, with hundreds of mounts arranged on long tables throughout the room. The deer heads clustered together, each in a different pose and angle, looking like a kind of animal Roman forum caught in mid-debate. A few of the mounts were a little gruesome, a deer with a mailbox impaled on an antler, another festooned with barbed wire, and one with an arrow stuck in its brisket, and one display, a coyote whose torso was split open to reveal a miniature scene of the World Trade Center, complete with little firemen and rubble piles, was surpassingly weird. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, the room was biblically tranquil. The lion at last lying down with the Corsican lamb, the family of jackdaws in everlasting, unrequited pursuit of a big green beetle, and the stillborn Bengal tiger cub magically revived, its face in an eternal snarl, alive looking although it had never lived. I didn't make that up about the coyote, (laughs) by the way. Um, I'm now going to read a little section from another story, which is um, kind of another genre of of the sorts of journeys that I go on. And that is, um, a lot of times, there's something in the news that seems to me it demands a, a sort of oblique response, um, that there's a story that's kind of at an angle to the news story that, that I like to end up writing about. This particular piece uh, came about after Timothy McVeigh had been arrested, and every, every story about him mentioned that he lived in a trailer park. Now, this was a sort of shorthand, obviously. It was supposed to mean something, but what struck me is that I didn't know what it meant. I knew that I had an assumption about what that meant, to live in a trailer park, but I had no real idea of what it meant. So I went to my editor at The New Yorker, and I said, I'd like to go to a trailer park. And he said, you know, I don't think we have anybody doing that right now. So um, this was, you know, he was thrilled, given that the expense account on this particular story would be extremely low. Um, But I, I decided what I wanted to do is spend some time in a trailer park and try to understand what that meant, since it was something so familiar and yet truly unfamiliar. I, I really didn't know what it meant. I decided to write about a trailer park that I just knew of because I had I used to live in Portland, Oregon, and I would drive by this trailer park occasionally. I realized I almost deployed a reporting technique that I dream of, which is taking a dart and throwing it at a map and going wherever the dart hits. But it, And the fact is you could find a trailer park that way. But I decided instead to go to the park that I happen to know of. When uh, I had called the manager before I came out there, and this is the sort of... Uh, It's funny, it's almost easier to call a well-known person and say, I'd like to do a story about you, than it is to call a manager of a trailer park in Portland, Oregon, and say, calling from the New Yorker, I'd like to come do a story about you. Nobody believes it. 
I, I mean, they, they can't believe it. They assume you're applying for a job or you're looking for a space to park your trailer. I mean, the idea that you'd want to come and spend time in a place that's not noteworthy, it's always an interesting obstacle. At any rate, I got out to Portland and I drove out to the trailer park and I, I pulled in, drove my way to the office and there was a young couple sitting outside and they saw me pull up and they came running over to the car and they said, hi, are you the reporter? And I said, yeah. And they said, we're undercover police informants. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> thus began my week at the trailer park. So I'm, I'm just going to read a, a sort of short version of this because it's actually a rather long story. Um, and I want to save time to read one more piece. But this is called We Just Up and Left. <clears throat> a guy known as the Cat Man lived in Portland Meadows Mobile Home Park for a while. He had 100 cats and a mouse-colored trailer which he parked in Space 19, near a knobby maple tree. This happened to be prior to the animal weight restriction, that is, the rule that residents in the park could not own a pet that weighed more than 20 pounds. None of the Catman's cats weighed more than around 10, but if you added them together, they would have weighed close to 1,000. And if the 20-pound rule had been in effect, they might have required some sort of waiver. This is all academic. <clears throat> because before the rule was enacted, the catman had hitched his trailer to his pickup and packed up his animals, and in a matter of minutes, all 101 of them were gone. In Portland Meadows, as in all trailer parks, people come and go. Everyone everywhere comes and goes, but people who live in trailers live in a constant state of possible mobility. Some people come to Portland Meadows on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon, and then leave after no time. Some people stay too long. A man who hated everyone and used a battery-operated bullhorn for normal conversation stayed in the park only a few years, but everyone could hardly wait for him to go. When he finally did, he pulled his trailer out and then sewed broken glass and planted pieces of barbed wire and crisscross fishing line all over his parking space. Some people stay for ages and are nearly unseen. They could disappear and no one would look for them because no one would notice they were gone. Last April, the park newsletter noted one of the hazards of being invisible. It said, we must request that persons please not be getting inside the dumpsters. A person could get knocked out trying to get into or out of a dumpster and not be discovered before the dumpster is emptied. Some people who live in the park, though, make a big impression. A phony blind priest with a Great Dane seeing eye dog lived in the park for just a couple of months, but no one will forget him. He had lots of high-spirited friends who used to visit and who didn't seem to mind at all that he wasn't really a priest, that the dog was blind, and that the priest, in fact, was the one with excellent vision. <laughs> Victor Gorbachev, who told me he's Mikhail Gorbachev's cousin, lives in Portland Meadows in a crumbly camper with busted pipes. He works as a driver for Space Age Fuel. He has lived in the camper since shortly after he arrived in America, except, he said, for five months he spent in prison. He's moved the camper three times, from Fairbanks to Phoenix to San Francisco to Portland. He says that life in Alaska, Arizona, and California was not particularly pleasant, but he loves Oregon, and for the moment he's planning to stay. Drifting in a house with a license plate is something that Viktor Gorbachev considers distinctive about the United States. He says, in America, the houses are as light as wood and you move them around. In Russia, our houses were made of bricks. Portland Meadows is in a saucer of land <clears throat> rimmed by the Columbia River, the Willamette River, and the stagnant, coffee-colored Columbia Slough. Downtown Portland is a few miles south. To the north and the east lie the snowy tops of Mount Adams, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Hood. To the west are a race car track and a horse track and the bundled black strands of the railroad tracks. It is an empty-looking landscape of big, homely things, big trucks, big truck stops, a big toy warehouse. In 1915, when the park opened, 
It was called Portland Auto Camp. And on advertising placards, its address was given as Union Avenue and North City Limits. The park lies low. The land it sits on is two feet below sea level. It may be the lowest point in Portland. It is part of the Columbia River floodplain. Several times in this century, it's been underwater. Jim Benson, who manages the park with his wife Jan, says, Oh, we're way down. We're really down in a hole. Now the address is 9000 Northeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, but from the road there is no sign of the park, no front gate or portal. There's only a steep pitch driveway, unmarked and unremarkable, that looks like one of the narrow off-ramps that truck drivers use when their rigs are running away. At the bottom of the driveway are a speed bump and a pothole, and then the asphalt levels off and the park spreads out in every direction, like a puddle. Except that it is older and bigger, Portland Meadows is a lot like any other trailer park. It has 200 trailer spaces, a beauty parlor, a dusty box of a building called the Country Store. It has an office and a laundromat. It has a dozen narrow lanes that even have names, Main Street, A Street, 12th Street. At any given moment, several hundred people live here. Some are single, many are divorced, some are old. There are babies and children, there are people living on welfare, and people with more money who just like low-maintenance living. There are Elkhart travelers and Airstreams, bulky Detroiters, and double-wide longs. None of this is visible from the road. I lived in Portland for five years and drove up and down this block of Northeast Martin Luther King Boulevard a million times and never saw anything to suggest that scores of lives were unfolding a few feet below me. People find their way here anyway. One recent afternoon, a boyish-faced man with wheat-colored hair stopped by the trailer park office. Got any trailers for rent? He asked. No rentals, Jan Benson told him. You rent the space, but not the trailer. I'm sorry, honey, you have to own your own. I've been motelling it for two months, the man said, jiggling his keys. His eyes had pink edges. He leaned on the counter, mussing a pile of post office change of address forms and flyers advertising pizza delivery, and one noting the next meeting of the Portland Meadows Bible Study Group. I come here from Missoula, he said. I've been bouncing from place to place. It's me and my two kids. Jan clucked at him soothingly. She is as big as a fullback, with thin, streaky hair and flushed cheeks and the tiniest, twangiest voice you've ever heard. Why don't you buy yourself a trailer, hun? she said. She pulled out a map of the park. Let's see. Number 86 is for sale. She can't pay her rent. She's deceased is why. <laughs> 65 is for sale. They're wanting more acreage, and our spaces aren't humongous. 63 is a repo. 73 is a repo. What kind of money are they wanting, he asked. She went over the prices, 4000 for an old single-wide, single, single wide, 10000 for something bigger, and the rent for the space was $260 a month. It's probably the cheapest possible way to live in Portland, and buying a trailer is certainly the cheapest possible way to live that would allow you to own something. He said he liked the idea of owning. Then she mentioned that all applicants in the park have to obtain a police report detailing any criminal record they might have. Well, let me be totally honest, he said. I've been to prison eight years ago, though, and i am done with all my supervised parole. Oh, it'll probably be okay, Jan said, but we have to visually see the report before we can rent to you. They talked a moment more about his parole, about his bouncing around from motel to t motel, about how he'd come to Portland to settle some matters, and that he didn't know if he would stay very long, but that if he bought one of the trailers, he could take it with him no matter where he wandered next. Then Jan mentioned the 20-pound rule, the restriction on the size of pets in the park. He listened, and a broody look crossed his face. I'm just thinking, he said after a moment, how would that apply to a Rottweiler puppy? <laughs> I think I have time for one, one more short piece. Okay. Um, Every now and again, though it seems very rare, I actually just go on a trip for fun. Um, and I have generally 
When I go on a trip for fun, I, I try to leave all you writing utensils at home so that I'm not tempted. Um, although it's kind of irresistible. It, the fact is that when, if you're used to writing, when you when you travel, you're you're just constantly absorbing things that strike you as great stories. So. I'm going to read a short piece that was from a trip where I went with absolutely no intention of writing, but it ended up being, as I said, sort of irresistible. Um, and this piece is called Shooting Party. When I went to Scotland for a friend's wedding last summer, I didn't plan on firing a gun. Getting into a fist fight, maybe. Hurling insults about badly dressed bridesmaids, of course. But I didn't expect to shoot or get shot at. <laughs> the wedding was taking place in a medieval castle in a speck of a village called Bigger. There was not a lot to do in Bigger, but the caretaker of the castle had skeet shooting gear, and the male guests announced that before the rehearsal dinner, they were going to give it a go. The women were advised to knit or shop or something. I don't know if any of us women actually wanted to join them, but we didn't want to be left out, so we insisted on coming along. We were not outfitted like an Edwardian shooting party. One woman was in a denim mini dress with red, white, and blue platform shoes. Another was wearing pedal pushers and wobbly pumps. I was in something lightweight and was tripping around in rubber flip-flops. The caretaker must have been horrified by the sight of us. He had small dark eyes and a tragic manner and was wearing a proper field jacket with suede patches in all the right places. He handled his gun with a wary tenderness as if it were a baby alligator. It was about the size of one with a double barrel and a thick wooden stock. None of us had ever done this before. We were gunless, gun-fearing city people, writers and filmmakers and art historians. Sissies, in fact, who <laughs> cringed when the caretaker raised the shotgun, wordlessly indicating that it was time to begin. He muttered a few instructions, then held out the gun, waiting. No one stepped up. After a moment, we turned on the bridegroom and shoved him forward. It was just one of those things, dumb luck probably, but the bridegroom had perfect aim, and he exploded the clay pigeon into a million pieces. The caretaker nodded and released another pigeon, and again the groom hit the target. It was inspiring. We all crowded up to take our turns. The guest in platform shoes went next and missed by a mile. An usher in Ray-Bans winged a few. One bridesmaid had perfect form but a hot finger on the trigger. Finally, it was my turn. I hadn't expected to like the feel of the gun, but I did. It was warm and smooth and knee-bucklingly heavy, with two triggers that were set so far apart that they might have been fitted for a giant's hand span. The caretaker sized me up and then spoke quietly. You want to hold it as tight as you, against your shoulder as you can, he said. It has a very powerful recoil. I squeezed the gun against my body. Tighter, he said. That's as tight as I can get it a little tighter. <laughs> I've never been kicked by a mule, so I can only imagine that it would feel a little like the gun slamming into me after I fired. My teeth rattled and my head rang like a school bell. I was hysterically excited, as breathless and thrilled as if I'd just robbed a bank. <laughs> Having missed, I begged for another shot. The caretaker released another pigeon, and I followed it, my arm aching from the weight of the gun and the shock of the recoil. I missed again, but I was close. The second recoil was just as bad as the first. I shot again and again and again, sending not a single clay pigeon to its reward, but each time getting closer. Me, firing a double-barreled shotgun, and I couldn't stop. The caretaker was egging me on, murmuring that if I had a gun that fit me properly, I'd be hitting everything. I didn't stop until the groom pointed out that we were being charged about a pound sterling per shot, and at the rate I was going, he wouldn't be able to afford a honeymoon. <laughs> Shooting enchanted me. This is my sport, I thought. I wondered where in Manhattan I could go to fire a gun. <laughs> the next morning, the day of the wedding, I woke up unable to lift my arm. <laughs> The bruise extended from my armpit to my elbow, and it was black and green and a deep imperial purple. 
I was wearing a sleeveless dress, as all the women in the wedding were, and they were all bruised to varying colors, <laughs> depending on how enthusiastic they'd been about the sport. We considered covering our injuries with under-eye concealer, but there was not enough to go around. <laughs> Fortunately, single malt scotch was available in huge quantities, and by the end of the night, we were showing off our bruises like tattoos. <laughs> Thank you. Hard to shift into that mode, in, but in um, boy, I, I love that taxidermy piece. It was great to hear you read it aloud. It was sort of like Dr. Seuss in the beginning, that sort of <laughs> chanting sound of them. Uh, I had actually, um, that was exactly what I was intending to do, and the problem was that I became obsessed with writing it as a Dr. Seuss story, <laughs> and there was a moment where I thought, I actually, I have to stop. I must stop this, but... I guess it was partly because, um, you know, the nature of animals and, and playing with these forms and animals, to me, it, that was immediately what it called to mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was also, I knew, and actually I heard someone gasp when I said the phrase fleshing machine. I mean, there's something disturbing about taxidermy, and I, I felt it needed... I needed to make the beginning gentle and sort of um, playful so it wouldn't gross people out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is that I've occasionally, you know, there is something thoroughly bizarre about it mm -hmm. and about anything having to do with death and dead animals and hunting. And, you know, it's it can be very disturbing. So I thought... Let me see if I can charm people into reading this and not have them immediately, you know, fall over. And the, the, one of the ironies is the longtime editor of The New Yorker, who is no longer the editor, but he was a staunch vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And there was always a problem presenting. Uh, John McPhee long ago did a fabulous piece about a woman who collected and ate roadkill. And um, he talked in, in an interview once about what it required for him to prepare William Shawn to read this piece, knowing that this was a man who lived on Special K and <laughs> was going to be a little distressed by the image that begins the story with her roasting a, a roadkill squirrel. But um, it worked. <laughs> Do you fish? <laughs> I don't fish. I've never been interested in fishing. Um, but I'm very interested in sort of weather-bound places and um, maritime communities and certainly all up in the north. That's it, fishing and the smell of fish and the talk about fish. I mean, they don't have any fish anymore. Right. Um, they're fished out in a lot of places, which adds to the kind of nostalgia and sadness of many of those places because especially with the herring fisheries um, at one time there were thousands of people working um, mm -hmm. to gut and pack the herring but no no I'm and I don't shoot either <laughs> <laughs> well I don't either except at weddings <laughs> very, very limited range <laughs> Shoeholm. Shoeholm. Ms. Mm -hmm. um, Orlean has an editor she can go to and say, I've got this great idea, what do you think? Who do you go to or who can you, do, is there somebody you can count on? Are you out there on a wing on a prayer hoping that this is a good idea? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I don't work for a magazine, so um, I pretty much cooked this idea up on my own, and it was one of those things that sort of started in a small way. I'm sure you've had that experience, the sort of small idea. I had 
was at a writer's residency in Cornwall, and I had gone through London, and I went to the bookstore, and I thought I'd get some books about whatever, the seafaring, and I found a book about women pirates called Bold in Her Breaches. And so I took it with me to Cornwall, and I had this great little stone house right on the tip of Cape Cornwall, and I read about Grace O'Malley, and I read about Anne Bonny and Mary Reed and some of the others, and I thought, oh, this is a wonderful subject. There must be lots more about maritime women. So I went back home to Seattle, and there was nothing more. There was very little, actually. There's a bit more now in the last few years. But I then kind of had this idea, I will go to Ireland, and I'll write something about Grace O'Malley. And the more I started planning this trip, the bigger it got. I thought, well, as long as I'm in Ireland, you know, I might as well go to Scotland. And then Orkney is just kind of a hop, skip, and a jump. And then I found out that there was a ferry that went in the summer um, from Shetland to the Faroes to Iceland. And I'd always wanted to see Iceland. And I've spent a lot of time in Norway. And I wanted to take the coastal steamer because long ago I had worked on the coastal steamer as a dishwasher. So I thought this would be great to take it as a passenger this time. And uh, before I knew it, it was four months long and I had spent a huge amount of money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm really pleased with the result. And um, then I had the sort of problem of too much material and then, you know, sort of working with an editor to trim it down. Um, I don't know if everybody heard the question, so I'll repeat it, which was how, how long, um, in particular, the trailer park story took and uh, probably stories in general. Um, I spent probably about eight or ten days um, hanging around the trailer park. And then it, it was not a an easy story to write, but it it laid itself out fairly clearly to me once I got back. So I probably wrote it in, after typing up my reporting and doing a little bit of additional reporting, I also went to a couple of other trailer parks while I was out there. Um, it probably took me about two weeks or so to write. And I think that's you know, it, it depends so much on, on the situation. I mean, this was something where I had to set a limit for myself because obviously I could have stayed for another week and another week, and I simply had to sort of set some parameters. With There are other stories like the taxidermy story where I knew that the, the hinge of the piece was the championship, which just lasted um, sadly lasted only a couple of days. <laughs> um, it's always next year. Right. <laughs> but there was also a lot of additional reporting that I did. So it, it varies quite a bit. I think time makes a huge difference with stories, particularly a piece like the trailer park where what you're trying to get is something that you can't, you can't have a list of questions. You can't show up and say, was there ever a guy here who had like 100 cats? <laughs> You know, it has to be that you're there long enough that people begin chatting with you about the ordinariness of the community, because it really is kind of a community. And that's something that you can't get at by coming in for a day, having a list of questions, and leaving. You just need to be there. There's a kind of spontaneity, too, that, you know, suddenly people will just begin to tell you stories you had no idea. That wasn't what you were looking for. Mm -hmm. And they will come up to you and, you know, for whatever reason, they'll just start telling you their life story or some peculiar thing. And it will be the perfect, yeah. perfect thing. And in a place that's kind of private. I mean, the mm -hmm. people in the trailer park were quite private and a little wary. And that is very common. And when you're writing a piece about something where there's no news going on. People are, don't understand why you're there, and that there is a kind of discomfort. There's also a fair, this tra particular trailer park had had in the past, and um, probably still has some element of drug dealing that goes on. So there was a particular amount of paranoia of what are you doing here? So it it was something where I had to I knew I had to spend a lot of time before people would start
start talking to me and talk talk to me in, a, in an unstudied way. Um, and luckily that happened. I, I was really surprised and, and pleased about it. There's also this phenomenon of people say, I don't want to talk to you, and then they start talking, um, which happened a lot there. I mean, people would say, you know, I'm busy. I don't want to talk. By the way, have you ever seen, you know, and the next thing I knew, I was in their trailer watching uh, an episode of, um, you know, Wheel of Fortune, and they were telling me about their life and how they'd ended up there. So that was kind of wonderful. Yep? This actually made me provoke you. I just thought of it when you commented on that last um, question. Can you comment on the transition between the information gathering and the reporting aspect of what you do and, and how it translates and how it transitions into the actual creative or the story writing part of your work? Well, um, just in terms of this book, I um, had a notebook and I drew a lot of pictures and I interviewed people and I sort of followed my nose. I mean, I would get to a place like, say, Stromness in Orkney and I uh, had met a woman in Kirkwall who said, you know, look up my husband. He runs a bookstore in Stromness. Go see him and check out this guy, Jim Robertson, whose great great aunt was a whaling agent and sent 800 men whaling every year. And so I arrived in Stromness and I did go to the bookshop and her husband wasn't really very friendly actually. But then I called up this Jim Robertson and he turned out to be this incredibly dapper old man who ran a fudge factory in Orkney and he said, come over, you know, and we'll talk. And I've got all of my great, great grandmother or great aunt's um, uh, ledgers there and I'll show them to you. So I spent the afternoon with him and of course the conversation went far away from my subject matter. You know, at the one hand, I was sort of looking at these ledgers and thinking, oh my God, I need to spend a week here trying to understand this. And he wanted to tell me his experiences in World War II and all about the fudge factory. There had been a bakery mafia. They hadn't let him get sugar, and that's why. <laughs> and then he showed me all around the factory, and it was sort of in a slump. Um, and there were incredible machines. There was no one working there. But there were these amazing machines, like something from, you know, a, a film from the space era, um, the Jetsons or something. And um, so I, a lot of that was not actually to my subject at all, which was the women in the sea. Um, so my challenge was to try and tell a little bit of his story and give the flavor of being in the fudge factory and weave that into the story of Christian Robertson, who was a very interesting woman. There was not very much written about her. Um, I was not able to find out too much more. I... Uh, did talk to his niece, Jim's niece, at one point, and she told me that her son had written a high school term paper on it. So that was about the extent of the written material. And my challenge was then to try and shape that into a chapter that was something about my experience in Stromness, the history of Christian Robertson, the whole hull whaling trade, which I had to research extensively to even understand what they were talking about, and then my interaction with Jim Robertson in the Fudge Factory, and to try and make that concise um, and you know only about 15 16 pages as opposed to the 50 that I probably could have written very easily um, I, I think of uh, narrative nonfiction as having three distinct pieces there's reporting there's thinking and there's writing um, the thinking part often doesn't happen, but uh, it's actually useful. Um, I, I do all my reporting at once and then all my writing. I don't write while I'm reporting. Um, I feel like I need to... It, it's a, such a different state of mind, and I also feel like I don't know what it is that I'm going to say until I'm done with that reporting. Um, I like having that time in between to I type up my notes I don't use a tape recorder so I'm typing from my handwritten notes I do a lot of additional reporting usually I don't do it before I tend to do it when I've returned the process of typing up the notes and reviewing them and going through and highlighting what mattered to me for me it's it's a, a way of re-embedding the information in my head a couple of times 
and it's I need that time in between to figure out what it is that why did I go to do the story to begin with and what is what's important about it what is it that I want to to tell people and how can I convince them to read it since so often I've chosen stories that don't have a natural constituency I don't <laughs> think for instance there are tons of trailer park residents buying the New Yorker so <laughs> I'm not naturally writing to that audience so I have to think okay I have readers who might be to begin with resistant to this as a story so how can I sort of picture myself at a dinner party with the million readers of the New Yorker and say wait a minute I've got to tell you about an amazing trip that I took so that thinking time is where I'm processing it um, I think structuring a story is the most challenging most difficult and in some ways most important part of it um, and I, I don't think that's something that you can lay out in advance I know a lot of people do outline I'm much more inclined to start writing and then begin seeing the shape it's taking and so it's partly organic and then it becomes deliberate as as I begin seeing what the story is turning into um, and as I said I don't write anything till I've gone through those other two stages which means that I often spend a long time thinking what have I gotten myself into because I haven't written a word yet um, but that's the way I've always written and um, I think different people have totally different methods and, and I think the important thing is to find what feels comfortable to you and, and to then work to make it work as best it can. Yep? Uh, my question is to both of you and it involves a relationship with your subjects, especially uh, with travel and with all other writing. You um, develop subjects that are eccentric and uh, perhaps I, I, my question has to do with the difficult, the difference between evocation and the, the, the risk of, sat, sat, of satire and of mocking them and of being patronizing and yet you never descend into that. I wonder how you imagine yourself and, and relate to your subject so that the pieces are respectful and at the same time colorful, evocative, especially when you come from a different world. And the, I would think the temptation is to see it as very alien. Well, I have a simple answer to that and then also a complicated answer, which is um, I, I don't think that's something you make up. I do these stories because I'm genuinely interested in them. And I don't think you would opt to go to a trailer park or go to a taxidermy convention unless you had some at some gut level a respect and genuine authentic curiosity to learn about that part of the world I don't really like writing about people who are very much like me I don't find it that interesting so I tend to always be the alien and you know I don't think that you stray very far from what your true feeling is I think if you go because you think people are ridiculous the piece will reflect that I think if you go um, in the case of the trailer park because I thought what is this world like not do I want to live there is this a better way to live than I live I mean those issues were irrelevant it was truly a desire to say what does it mean to say that someone lives in a trailer park what's that world like and the stories you know I think everything has an element of humor and at the same time an element of poignancy and satire to me misses those two edges and, and it comes from some very different posture which I I don't feel I have even when I'm writing about things that I find I did a piece that is in this book about Thomas Kincaid and you know I don't desire to own Thomas Kincaid paintings <laughs> but I came to the story with a authentic desire to say this is a huge phenomenon and I, I really want to understand it I, I mean I I just don't find it hard to look at those worlds without it being a matter of value of this is better or worse than what I have this is um, because it feels different to me it's about seeing the world and and not holding it up to your own life and saying which is better or this is ridiculous I would really hate it if it were 
perceive that way. I'd feel that I had failed utterly because my goal is so completely different. It's to say, here's a world that you didn't think you could care about, but, you know, I think you could. I think if you, if you just have an open mind, you could find this interesting, or at least you'd leave feeling you knew the world a little better. And, and I think that's, that's my guiding principle, and, and I think that keeps me in that spot and not in satire. I, I would really feel that it was a huge failure if it were perceived that way. I think one thing I think about is trying to keep the humor in the situation and not on the person, sort of, so that I'm not making fun of them. I am often finding the situation that I'm in humorous. Um, and one of my experiences, actually I had many experiences like this on this trip, where I felt like I was sort of kidnapped by someone. They would say, oh, I'm going to tell you about my ancestor or about uh, the whole history of Iceland. Or they would say, let's take a trip somewhere. So I would be kind of trapped with them in the car, or I would be in their little village that I had traveled miles and miles and miles to come to. So I couldn't actually get away from them. <laughs> and they would be these incredible talkers, you know, in sort of foreign accents or foreign languages sometimes. Um, and uh, they would be telling me all this stuff, and I would not be able to escape. So I had to find humor in that situation. When I was in Iceland, people had said, oh, you must talk to um, Thorun Magnusdottir. She knows everything about the history of Icelandic fisherwomen. And many places that I had gone to on my trip, of course, they had said, we know nothing, we have no one, no one ever went to the sea from your gender. Um, but in Iceland, they all said, but surely you have heard of our great fishing foremother, Thuridor Formidor, um, Skipper Thuridor, and they said, and this woman, Thorun Magnus Dutcher, knows everything about her. You should go see her. She's 80 years old, and she lives in this tiny village in the West Fjords. And it was way the heck way, way, way on these fjords and Iceland is really scary driving and finally I had got a friend to come with me at that point um, and we rented a car and it took us two days to get there. So we, then we were there and then she was a talker and she didn't want to talk about Icelandic fishing. She wanted to tell me about her marriages and her one of her husbands had been in the Spanish Civil War and then she had written some books about Romania and she wanted to show me about uh, her communist past and then she finally pulled out some things about the skipper through it, or and she did tell me a lot. Um, and I had a challenge. I, I wanted to write about her in a in a funny way because it was a funny situation. This 80-year-old woman who was very precise, and she kind of she had a way of speaking English that was very old-fashioned, and she would sort of. <laughs> And then she would find the word. And at first I thought about, should I put in this speech mannerism? And then I thought, nah, that's sort of gratuitously cruel. Um, but she had invited two, uh, three young women who were daughters of fishing families over to have a little party with us. And orange Fanta and chocolate cake and all this stuff. And the girls thought she was very funny, too, talking about fishing. Oh, fishing. Who wants to fish? Um, so I tried to kind of keep some of the flavor of the oddness of this event. And, you know, for instance, that she tried to make me read her books about Romania before I'd had coffee in the morning. And that my friend was always sort of saying, oh, I think I'm going for a walk, you know. Um, <laughs> and I would be looking helplessly. And the fact that Thorun kept feeding us um, things like um, f gray flatbread and chocolate skur and <laughs> dried herring and... You know, my friend Terry, who would much prefer to go to Tuscany, was just <laughs> having a fit, you know. Um, so I tried to keep some flavor of that without actually making fun of her and also showing how wise she was, how smart she was. Um, you know, I, I really appreciated the research that she did, and she knew a ton. So that's the kind of the line that I sometimes found myself skating, is um, to make to make the situation humorous and to poke fun at myself, too, for being on this completely bizarre quest um, and asking these kinds of questions. And at the same time, to let people have their humanity. And as you were saying, not compare them to you or not try and say, my way is better, they're stupid. I mean, that's not at all what I want to do. Um, but in order to make the writing rich and full and funny uh, and interesting, you have to make people 
idiosyncratic. I mean, you have to show their idiosyncrasity. In the back there. I think of these as very particular, um, that they're journeys of a moment that I made rather than, um, you know, I don't try to write them as an authoritative piece about the kingdom of Bhutan, but rather a very particular moment at a particular time when I traveled there. Um, and, you know, I suppose you can draw lots of conclusions from that if you're a person who's thinking, gee, I might go to Bhutan, but I, I don't write them as prescriptive at all. I, and I think it's a very different kind of writing. Um, I think some people do it well, but mostly it's not as interesting to me. I'm much more interested in the particular journey. Yeah, I would agree. I've done some destination travel writing, and um, it's not very satisfying in some ways. I mean, just to go to a place and to describe it, and the word count is really usually limited, and um, you are sort of writing for a market, whatever it is, um, and you are then encouraged to, you know, eat and sleep in sort of certain kinds of places so that you can describe them to others. So in that way, yeah, you are act acting as a scout. Um, some places give you more leeway. I've written for Slate, and they have a well-travel column, and you can kind of write whatever you want. Um, and that's very liberating, but still, you're not really encouraged to explore your own quest in any way. And to me, that's what's interesting about travel, is that there are parallel journeys going on. And I think that um, there's a wonderful Irish phrase, on Toras, which is the journey. And um, it has been used um, in religious, uh, has a religious meaning in that you make a circuit and you stop and you make a prayer or you, um, you kind of remember wh why you're there and, and what you're doing. And I thought about my trip sometimes as sort of a circumnavigation of memorials. And that brought me into contact with, you know, why did I want to be on this trip? What was changing in me? And I, I like that idea in all of all travel writing and all travel books that you see something of the author. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot, but you have to see something of who they are and why why those places are important to them. You see those places kind of refracted through their through their telling because no one will look at the same no one will look at the same place in the same way. One one more really good question. <laughs> Don't feel any pressure. <laughs> yes. Uh, this is for Susan. Uh, you know, you've written one book that was kind of a theme, the Saturday night theme, and the others have been random shots of these particular stories you're talking about. Uh, do you think you'll ever do another theme uh, book? I know your colleague, John McPhee, writes a lot of theme things and gets off on a kick. Uh, you, well... These, they're all very different. I mean, I wrote Saturday Night, you know, as you said, it was a, a, a kind of set of set pieces that were all connected. Um, these other two collections I've done, the pieces were all published beforehand, so there's a slightly different kind of connection between them, and they're much more loosely organized. Um, this has a theme 
being this idea of pieces about places and the bullfighter checks or makeup was much more specifically profiles. Um, I'm working on a new book that, like The Orchid Thief, is a whole book. It's not pieces. So, and God willing, it has a theme. Um, <laughs> is that the biography of Rin Tin Tin? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but it's a biography of Rin Tin Tin. And, um, but I love doing Saturday Night. I mean, in a way, it was almost like hiring myself as a magazine writer to go do uh, 18 pieces that were very much connected. And I have a million, billion ideas of other thematic, um, episodic books like that that I, ju I would love to do. It, and the, it was a real pleasure. I mean, doing Saturday Night was wonderful. I loved taking an idea and examining it in a you know, this 18 different sort of environments. I, I, I resisted doing it again because there are arguments just for career-wise that it's better to do a book like The Orchid Thief that was a whole book. But I would love to do it again. It was really a pleasure. Maybe after Rin Tin Tin, that's, that's what I'll do. But I, I really did have a, literally a hundred billion ideas um, of other thematic collections like that that I would really love to do. I guess that's it. I certainly want to thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure, and thank you, Barbara, for thank you, sharing the Thanks. table with me. <laughs> and,